Yeah, I think we are ready. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Welcome to Shireen Nishat, A Loss for Words. Um, I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and it's such a pleasure to see you all here in person tonight for a conversation featuring Shireen Nishat, Fong H. Bui, and Nato Thompson with the closing poetry reading by Hale Liza Gafori. We're thrilled to have Hale here this evening as well. Um, before we get started, as is real tradition, um, we would like to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. Um, we would like to acknowledge that here in New York we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we are speaking from. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's guests and host. Video and installation artist Shireen Nishat explores the political and social conditions of Iranian and Muslim life in her works, particularly focusing on women and feminist issues. Nishat was born in Kasfin, Iran, and left the country to study art in the U.S. at 17. She graduated from the UC Berkeley in 1982. When she returned to her home in 1990, she found it barely recognizable from before the 1979 revolution, a shocking experience that incited the meditations on memory, loss, and contemporary life in Iran that are central to her work. Her Women of Allah series introduced the hallmark themes of her pieces through which she examines conditions of male female, public, private, religious, political, and secular identities in both Iranian and Western cultures. Author, curator, and cultural infrastructure builder Nato Thompson is the founder of the Alternative Art School. With over 20 years of experience in the art world, he served as artistic director at Philadelphia Contemporary, chief curator at Creative Time, and curator at Mass Mocha. He has written two books of cultural criticism, Seeing Power, Art, and Activism in the 21st Century, and Culture as Weapon, the Art of Influence in Everyday Life, among many others. And our host tonight, artist, writer, and independent curator Fong H. Bui, is publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. Among many other awards, Bui received the Dorothea and Leo Rabkin Prize for Arts Writers in 2017, was the recipient of an honorary doctorate from University of the Arts in 2020, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Distinguished Service to the Arts in 2021. And with that, it's my absolute privilege to pass it over to Fong. Thank you. Is there a, a little sustaining distortion there? Okay, that's better. Okay, can I have another uh, beer? <laughs> I need to lick it up a little bit. Um, so, yes, um, thank you so much for being here, you all. Um, I'd like to dedicate this evening, as we are being here together, uh, to the memory of the heroic Masha and Mini, and our brother and sister, more than three of them, of them whose life has been taken by the Iranian you know, police. And I, I haven't grown up in Vietnam, I, I felt this deep affinity towards the life lost there. And in, in her tombstone, in her hometown, it write the inscription that say, beloved, your name will be remembered and it will become a symbol. And that it is. So I, I very much ask all of us to have a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, I'm sure many of you have been 
in Siena, Italy. It's a small town, beautiful town in Tuscany. And many of you who have been there more than once will remember that little city is known for many things. One being the home of the oldest bank ever invented in the world, the Monte de Paschi. That was 1472. Among other things, thousands, hundred thousand visitor, art lovers, would make their pilgrimage to see the school of Sienese painting particularly the Duccio Maestra painting in the Duomo there. And I would add also, since I wrote a little paper on my traveling grant in 1967, no, 87, um, on the little cycle, I mean, it's not little, it's huge, cycle of fresco by Ambroso very important cycle that depicting the allegory of, of good and bad government. So that's the, the subject that I somehow thought about a great deal because I remember in depicting the effects of good government and bad government, which is unusual at the time because when commissioned artwork was being made, it was mostly religious theme. But in this instant, it's civic. And thinking about good and bad government, and I couldn't help but since I lastly, I don't know, two weeks ago, I spent the weekend reading this wonderful book by the Scottish historian named Neil Ferguson, and it's called The, the Square and, the, and Tower. It's an interesting concept because when think about the, the, the Piazza Campio, which is a very famous piazza in, in Siena, this is where the informal casual gathering of people, they conduct their show, show affair there, which has been in a way underestimated, whereas the shadow of the tower hoover over, which is the the, the place where the hierarchy holding the power take place. So we think about that for a minute, and then the whole thing about the Trumpian America, which reminds me uh, so much of Jacksonian America of 1830s. So what happened between Serena and I, we've both been old friends forever, will never be we are constantly forever be dislocated. We neither Iranian, Vietnamese, nor we American. We have one foot there and one foot here, uh, but we always get in between that space, between two culture. We share many political, um, social upbringing, similarly, I would say. But during the, the course of Trump presidency, the urgency to go back and understand America was so interesting. So one of the things I did was not only going back and reading all the 85 articles and essay in the Federalist paper, the two volumes, 1835 and 1840, by Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. It's probably the best book ever written about America. It's probably the best book ever written about democracy. And it's so interesting in thinking about what we have gone through the Trumpian years. One thing that we all realized um, readily, very clearly, was that he's good with speed. The notion of speed is something that he's so good at. He knows how to deploy technology for his own advantages. Prior to the presidency, I did not have an iPhone. I was romantic. I was somewhat cryptic of my own mediation with technology. But that's all changed because I remember when Hitler, in his autobiography, 
man come, my struggle. He talked about technology. He talked about all of these things. So when he was asked to make cheap radios to give away to every single household in Germany, so that way it can carry his message across very fast, very quickly. It's not that different than you think about Benito Mussolini. By the way, Benito is not an Italian name. That was given to him by his devoted, hardcore members of the Socialist Party in Italy, who were admirers of Benito Juarez, the first indigenous democratic president of Mexico. Yeah, I know. There's many things we did not know <laughs> until the Trump arrival. Uh, the point is that one thing that I've always been so impressed with Serene. We've been friends for a long time. I think I interviewed her at least three, four times in greater length. Uh, but still, the, 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 the urgency... First of all, can I just make a little pretext again, Serene, because I've been reading a great deal of Immanuel Kant. And one of the things that impressed me most about Kant, in addition to his moral philosophy, he had this notion about what is called his theology, which is implication of what makes one rich in one's own natural end, instead of reacting to the cause from which we came, we came from. So you can't blame your parents, really, on <laughs> this matter. Your parents abuse me or treat me a certain way, therefore it prevents me to become who I potend to become. It's natural and it's something that if your head is telling you that you ought to be playing the piano, but what you're really good at is something else. So natural and is really something that I've been obsessed with recently, rereading it, thinking about it. Uh, and I couldn't help but because the fact that Serene, who gone to Berkeley for undergrad and graduate school, as a painter, it's a painting major, mind you. In fact, when I came to New York, I met one of her classmates, an artist, a painter named Barbara Freeman, and her husband, a, a Nietzschean scholar, a philosopher named Nick Pappas. And I saw a painting by Serene when she met, when she was UC Berkeley, would you believe it? It's the same central life phase in the middle, but it's painted rather impoverishly, not with great clarity or passion. Um, so why am I saying that? What I'm making up, am I embarrassing my friend Serene? I don't mean to, uh, but you know, the fact that she did that and she came to New York, um, I think, what year was it, Serene, 83, am I right? So it was the year after storefront of architecture were created. All right, so this is a good place to begin and you can follow me, okay, NATO? Because the idea is, you know, is, is I, know, I love the idea that it's never too late to become what you may have been. Yeah. yeah, so Serene took a while. I'm talking about like 10 good years. So can you describe why you eventually had to give up painting? and do something else. The microphone is there, Serene. Here, to use this. You got it, okay. First of all, thank you for being here tonight. And it's an honor to be talking to the two gentlemen. Um, yes, okay. Um, um, I, how do I answer that? I was a terrible painter. That's. <laughs> I was the worst uh, artist in the school, and I was a very bad painter. I'm sorry that you saw one of the work. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Um, yes, I mean, I've never been very good at any particular medium, and in, in, I've never been trained in anything, so I've kind of been lousy in all of them, but just trying different things. But painting has definitely not been. 
I, I just want to say, because you started uh, with Iran and Masa Amini, and, um, and I just want to say that um, for the past 50 days or more, um, as Iranians, and I think there's a few here, uh, we felt so dis disjointed from everything else. And I must say that I feel, as I sit here, um, a little bit disjointed because I haven't been really thinking about arts or, I mean, in, in this way. And I hope I do a good job because I think the, the project that we did with NATO, it's quite meaningful as well. But I, I, and it makes me think about um, when I was, for 10 years, I didn't go back to Iran when I was living in America. And I went back after the revolution. And now this is a revolution happening in Iran. And, and I think for almost all of us Iranians, it's difficult to be whole. Outside of your own country, it's even maybe more difficult because you, you're inundated with news, but you're not really able to help beyond certain. But mentally, you are quite paralyzed, if that makes any sense, um, as you're inundated with the footage and the images and the, the events in Iran. So I'm going to do my best, um, but my head is somewhere else, if that makes any sense. Um, and and I, mm, I excuse myself for that, because I, I think that is something I have to be very honest about. Yeah. yeah. NATO, where, where do you come in? To sure, the sure. So, first of all, thank you, Fong. Thank you, Sharin. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We do live in historic times. I was going over all my curatorial essays. I think I'm the only one. I swear there's one I wrote that literally no one read, including myself. There's one of them are out there. But I was going through them and I realized for the first 15 years of my life, they all started with, never before have we been in such dark times politically. And I was like, is, I always meant it every time I wrote it, whether it was during the Patriot Act, whether it was during the financial crisis, whether it was during Occupy Wall Street. It always felt dire, the conditions of capitalism, climate, quite corrosive, yet hopeful. There is a certain kind of perniciousness of perpetual precarity and political doom. Um, I do know that particularly during the post 9-11 Patriot Act era, and then the time of Occupy and during Black Lives Matter, just something about art's role to revolution is that you get pressure to not think about art. That people say, this is not the time for art because of course the time for action is now. And I feel that divide often at times. Funny enough, I did this thing, I did this show called Living is Form in 2011 and it opened the day that Occupy started. I remember very well. And most of the artists in the show were down there. Mm -hmm. And everyone was saying, you, gotta, you just gotta get down, forget the show, get in it, right? And you feel these kind of pulls, these extreme pulls, that art kind of gets buried. But I have to say, in retrospect, so much of the energy came from the kind of dynamic between revolution and art. So much of the fuel. And it often, increasingly historically, artists are, have always been, self-identified artists, are always in that mix. So I've actually, over the years, been very much more confident about art's deep connection to revolutionary global culture and also positioning values other than straightforward utility, that there is a utility in non-utility or poetics that feeds us, especially as you live an entire life where the essay of your life is never before have we lived in such dark times. So I say all that, now what's the role here? You know, I, the inter inter introduction, it said, Nato Thompson's cultural infrastructure builder. I just wanna say I work at a uh, commissioning presenting NFT company called uh, Art World. We're interested in using blockchain to build a different kind of art world using intentional revenue streams that we commissioned. This project by Sharin Nishat called A Loss for Words. I want to say this to the NFT haters or whatever. There's reasons to hate a lot of stuff. But this is something I think is important that Fong mentioned about uh, is, is evidenced in this building in Brooklyn Rail. Sharin's past was storefront for art and architecture, and my relationship to the arts in general. This is a time to build alternative worlds. 
Last I checked, money is a part of that. And true alternative worlds require intentional revenue streams. Ask the Black Panther Party. Ask things that actually get traction. And I do think there's problems with blockchain, but part of working with Shireen was A, to make a dream come to life in art, but also to demonstrate that you can use revenue streams to build a different world. So that's just me positioning what we hope to do with our world. Yeah, and, and, and I, I wanted to mention a little bit about the, the genesis of Woman of Allah. So that was 93 when Serene began making those haunting, iconic, black and white, relatively small images, mostly herself in the beginning, and then have all the inclusion of all the figures in it. And what is so striking about the Woman of Allah is that it's almost an omen of what's happening now. Uh, with Amini and all the young women in the world are protesting. It's a global situation, Serene. Um, and it's so important to think about the, the alchemy of the image, the sustaining power that slow you down and make you think about other things. It's particularly the culture that you don't know. And I think that is one of the most powerful series of images that I think are just as powerful as reading Edward Said's great book, Orientalism. Um, I think that's a role that I feel it must have been incredibly challenging for you with certain great urgency after years and years not even bother painting, re-questioning yourself. It's not the right material for you. It's not the right, you know, medium for you. And then you absorb by having that 10 years solidly involved in store for an architecture, which is a social platform. It involves activism. It wasn't just art. So can I ask you a question, Serene? The, the, comp the, the composure or the desire to acknowledge that and then finally gone back to Iran after Khomeini's death. And what happened to you then? Well, if I can just make a point, um, because as NATO was talking, Woman of Allah was a reflection on a revolution that had already taken place in 1979. So it was a kind of a fictionalized way of reinterpreting history and symbolically talking about the real foundation of the religious fervor. And now I'm getting to your point, but the, the issue today is that we're going, we're right, it's, there's a very raw feeling of being in the middle of a revolution. There's no distance. Um, things are unraveling day after day with an absolute uncertainty who is going to win, how many young people are going to die, get arrested, is the government going to suppress the movement, which one every morning. So um, very often they say we need the artists to, to make images or work because it's really interesting for a country that doesn't support art how important the role of the artists have become in this movement including musicians to filmmakers to artists. And I, I find it extremely different than in the Woman of Allah because I had so much perspective and distance in terms of history. Right. And now it's like happening now. I'm looking at the faces of people dying on the street five minutes ago. And, and then I'm asked, can you come up with an image that sort of captures the spirit of this movement, and it's, it's a huge difference. Um, and then I wanted to say something that, interestingly enough, the women of Allah were mainly about how the female body was used as a space to, to really navigate ideological religious rhetoric by the men. Mm -hmm. Basically, it became a battlefield for the men to exercise their notion of power, control, and beliefs. And 
1925, the Reza Shah forced the woman on veil, and then later in the revolution, they were forced to veil. And, and, and how the female body has been this contested space, mm -hmm. politically, religious, ideologically. And, and that, um, so I've done different work that basically explained how if you want to really comprehend the history of Iran, you can basically study the history of feminism. Mm -hmm. And that's a fascinating issue for a country that the women have been so oppressed and yet so powerful. Another thing that, oddly enough, I think that I've been a strong believer and is shown in my work is regardless of how up against the wall the women have been in Iran, they've always been very defiant, powerful, rebellious, and resilient. Whether it's in the video of Turbulence or the Women of Allah mm -hmm. um, or the, you know, the films that I made, uh, every work that I've made, the women always took their destiny into their hands. Woman so, without men. A woman without men. Um, so the issue is that I've always believed in this power of women in Iran, generation after generation. Mm -hmm. But I'd never imagined that a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old um, child be the voice of the woman as well, which is now, today. And, and how a government would be willing to kill a child a 15, 14, 16 year old, um, and, and rape, and, and it's, it is this level of fascism, it's, it's not believable, and how, anyway, you know that. So now, what was your question? How did I uh, find Iran? Yeah, I mean, we talk about the store fund. We talk about, I mean, NATO, your book was a big influence on me, art and activism. I know you have had this tendency to always spread out to more grassroots um, relationship to the art world. And I grew out of that environment. Franklin Furness, Martha Wilson is here, who gave me my first show. We, as alternative spaces, believed in art as being a part of the society art and social responsibility mm -hmm. were incredibly integrated. And Sho um, Shoja Kyung Park, my ex, was a really an activist as much as an architect, as much as a designer, as much as a conceptual person and intellectual. And so he always brought art and architecture in, in, in relation to social responsibility. And, and so I had this methodology and this com this relationship to New York in the 80s and 90s, which was truly special. And a lot of us are in this room were living in that time in New York, where art was not what it is today. And, and that basically, um, you know, I, I wouldn't even say activism, it was art um, was not as precious and market oriented. Mm -hmm. So having come from this foundation of the storefront and not having been in my country for 11 years, and entering a country that had transformed inside out. Yeah. Literally, I say, color was lifted. And this government had um, basically made it into Islamic State. Um, and I, I, it was quite shocking. But I found in that experience an obsession uh, where I wanted to go under the skin of um, the kind of religiosity or the fervor that the, the, mm -hmm. the way in which what was the foundation of this revolution that was enabled this country to transform from a cosmopolitan society to what we had today. Yeah. Um, so it, it then it gave birth to the woman of Allah. But another last thing I want to say is it's difficult. Um, you talked earlier about being hybrid artists, being one that doesn't quite belong to there or here. I'm not quite American, I'm not quite Iranian. Um, the Iranian people might feel a certain distance from me because, hey, I've been here longer than in my own country, and yet I feel a distance to Americans, mm -hmm. they to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet my work also sort of embodies that kind of hybridity. So, uh, and so Woman of Allah, it's a, quite a conceptual approach to stu studying history. 
Yeah. And and but that's because I had a very Western education. Yeah. Come from New York. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that briefly, Serene, because I grew up similar with you, your own background, gone to French, and you gone to is it English boarding school? So we have similar upbringing. Um, but we'll get to that for a minute. I just want to mention that Serene's show is Franklin Furnace. In 1983, um, it was the 90, show. 90, 93. 93. 93. 93. She's the reason I became an artist. Yeah. So that's the, <laughs> the really? great, yeah, that's our, our dear friend there, uh, the founder of Franklin Furnace, who just told me that she's working on a book on it. On, on the, the history. 50th anniversary. Yeah. And uh, it was a show that um, I remember Cindy Sherman told me that it's knock her socks off. She couldn't sleep for a week. And I believe she might have been, she might have bought one after. And I know that it meant a great deal to Chuck Close too. So many, just to name a few people who, who did come to see the show, Serene, um, and immediately recognized her greatness. Okay, I want to shift Fong, the subject. You can't a just bit. name drop like that. <laughs> well, I mean, why not? I mean, <laughs> just because of these people are well known, yeah, that yeah, doesn't yeah. mean. Right, right. Okay, so the, the, the construct of the art world can be very, um, I would say, complex right. because we do not want or expect in a certain artist do to their own autonomy. In other words, just as someone who makes square painting in white color simply doesn't mean it's as much politically uh, impl implied as at his own autonomy like Robert Ryman. Sure. No more, no less than someone who made painting that was visibly and overtly political like our late friend Leon Gollop or Nancy Sparrow. And I think thinking back to during the war in Vietnam, there was such understanding mutually. You come together, the artist coalition. You don't talk about your own work, you talk about matters at hand. What's going on, what can we do together? And that, I think that's something that we need to sort of bring, resurrect that spirit a little bit here. Uh, I was very heartbroken when I couldn't bring the, you know, the Women's March and Black Lives matter together. I try, I try so hard, um, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna stop there. All right, so the next question, which I wanted to I bring immediately to Serene and you, NATO, okay. is again, I talk about the women of Allah now, the strong resonance is so incredibly meaningful to anybody who look at the women of Allah and seeing what happened in especially young women, Serene, what happened in Iran, and over the world. It's a global, it's the global Amini protest. It's not just in Iran anymore, so we know that. But the alchemical aura of the, of the image is what something I want to talk about. Um, because Serene had made easily 13 videos. They're all brilliant but it was not film until Woman Without Man. That was your first film. And I had the privilege watching it during the making of it. The third cut, fourth cut, and finally the final edit version of it. So it must have been, I must have seen it at least four times altogether. My point is there's a reason that Serene and occasionally Shoja so we want to, want to acknowledge Soja Azari, a great artist, um, partner of Serene, collaborator for a long time, um, is the, the, the desire, again, to mobilize the image. And you couldn't do it better with film. Yeah, All right, so the, the, the MFT, is that what it's called now? I'm super ignorant about MFT. I'm gonna hope, is he gonna explain it? and then someone will do it. But similarly, MFT is another way of adding to that, that ability to mobilize. 
So that's a super political act on Serene's part, for sure. Um, so, well, you NATO? Know, I mean, sure, so I'll say this. So, Franklin Furnace is turning 50 years old. Congrats, Martha, that's amazing. And we were just chatting about how a lot of the cultural institutions of New York started in that era. I mean, you know, New Museum, um, The Kitchen, Creative Time. Creative Time was started when I was born, 72, funny enough. But, um, but there's an era in New York where people could get space. How many of you want to go buy a big building in New York right now? So what do you do? How do you build counter institutions when you can't buy them? Well, I do think the opportunity to produce digital infrastructure offers different opportunities that are profound. And I do think, to your point about, it's interesting, you mentioned Hitler and Trump. And often, if you think about media, tyrants are equivalent with the mediums of their time. Hitler was the radio, and Trump is Twitter. Yep. Trump isn't trying to use Twitter. Trump's personality fits perfectly with Twitter. They are synonymous, and it's not an accident. And historically, power and technologies come, rise up at the same time. Go hand in hand. They do, and for artists, I think sometimes we can be very reactive to power in a profound way, but sometimes we miss the boat because we're so defensive. And right now there's new forms of power being created digitally, as we know. I always am like, I don't live in the matrix because that looks way cooler than my Zoom. I live like whatever, a few levels below the matrix. Um, but I do think there are profound opportunities for artists to build other infrastructures. And you know, just to, to, to do that, and I think that you know, Shirin has been extremely adaptive and courageous in trying to find different audiences for different ways of expressing herself. And you know, we live in a world, a multi-platform world, right? Like, you might be famous on TikTok, and no one's heard of you that's on Twitter, and no one's heard of you on Facebook, like, you know what I mean? Like, we live in a multi-platformed society, and you really do miss out on different people, depending on where you express yourself in a medium. It's really fun. Wild, I think. Um, but I think it, you know, it does serve us as artists and as cultural producers to think about that strategically. So maybe to throw it over to Sharon and Fong, you know, because also Brooklyn Rail, you mentioned to me like how profound Zoom was for your audiences. Never heard of the world before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ever, you know. But again, I mean, I remember clearly it was Monday, March 16, 2020. Yeah. NATO? Yep. He came on television about 2.30 p.m. It was the first day that we all working from home. And he say the word social distancing. I got chills over my body. Mm. And I realized it's a manipulative word, manipulative. In other words, what he's saying is that you artistic type, bohemian, gay, lesbian, black, Asian, immigrant workers, marginals, please, whatever you do, do not get together like what you did in the 60s. It will not be good for tyrants when people get together. So I realized that uh, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. So I realized two things is that he's good with speed. He's like a poet of haiku first rate, two or three words, <laughs> lying Ted, crooked Hillary, <laughs> Francis Wong, you know, drain this. I mean, he's good at that kind of thing, and what are we to do? So immediately we have a meeting, and I ask my team, um, what can we, can Zoom reach more than 50 people plus? And they say yes. It took a while for them to walk us through. Swear to God, I call up Sereen and Shoja around 11 p.m. And I say, Shoja, Sereen, I know you guys have been working on this amazing film called Land of Dreams about a young Iranian who somehow gets stuck in New Mexico collecting people's dreams for the Census Bureau. 
It's an amazing film. So I said, can you come the next morning <laughs> at one o'clock? It's called New Social Environment Lunchtime Conversation. And today we've done already 682 episodes. We did not stop. It's every day and I realized the way to counter Trump is quick or speed is the slowness of culture. Mm. But we had to do it aggressively. <laughs> and with speed. <laughs> so that's why the Zoom was so fitting to us. You know, so, okay, so to talk about slowness again, um, you know, Mussolini was a very famous young journalist writing for Advanti magazine, which is a socialist magazine in Milano. And then when he advocated for Italy to enter the first war, he was kicked out by the party. He, he grew in terrific embitterment. So he went to the army himself, where he met, guess whom? Filippo Manaretti, who he admired already because Manaretti uh, Futurist Manifesto already been published in front page in 1913 of Parisian newspaper, La Figaro. And when you think about speed, technology and violence, that's futurism, isn't it? So it's very important to be mindful how people like that would exploit the artists. So it's important to know that even when you think about Steve Bannon, the, the, his master is Andrew Bradbot, Bradbot News. And in talking to a certain artist friend, that fellow used to hang out at the Mud Club in New York City, where Jean-Michel Basket, Warhol, Schnabel, people like that spend time with. So don't think these people are naive. They are the insider. Just say that you know, Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley. These are law students at Harvard and Princeton. They choose to speak the language that they do. All right, going back to Serena again. <laughs> <laughs> the slowness of the image yeah. and the fact that she chose to make film. To me, that's brilliant. Serene, am I right about that? I mean, it was a deliberate decision to make film because you want to reach wider audience. Yeah, I, I thought you were talking about the NFT, but the film... We'll, we'll get to the NFT. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, yes, um, the truth is that after um, having a very active career in arts and making many videos and uh, photographs, um, I felt a lot of exhaustion from um, just being in this circle um, that seemed very insular and uh, for someone who was claiming to be making very meaningful work, I was making additions of photographs one after another. <laughs> it became, um, uh, for me, morally problematic that what I was really doing is just feeding the markets and uh, at, at the end um, feeding the collectors and museums, which I appreciate. But um, I wasn't really reaching the audience um, that I was hoping to reach, which is, let's say, the people of Iran or people who don't go to galleries and museums. And, and so I took a, a, a kind of six years hiatus, um, and I readapted the book into a movie called Women Without Men, and which became a very historical film and took place in 1953 and we shot in Morocco, and it's about four women who basically uh, run away from their difficult private lives, and it's a magic realist novel, and they create their own society in a garden. They live together and closed off from the world. Uh, it's very conceptual story, I would say, but it was a lot about freedom and, and uh, female freedom. So um, um, that film did well, and... Uh, and then I made two more. But uh, to just answer your question uh, more directly is, yes, this film reached Iran, 
who knew the book very well because the book was written by an Iranian woman who was in prison by, because of this book for a number of years. And she lives in exile. And, and the government obviously wouldn't show the film, but it was um, spread through piracy. And uh, I, I was to my shock, uh, even my, my mother would go to a doctor's office or something. They would say, oh, your, you know, your daughter made, I, I seen that film, which is really for me was a shocking experience that I would be able to finally penetrate in the Iranian community, not through my art, <laughs> but a movie. Um, and, and so when uh, really this was for me, um, I did an opera. I mean, the idea of working with different platforms, reaching to audience who have no clue who you are and have no clue of your signature as, as a visual artist, um, but are able to relate to whatever that is that they're looking at, it gives me a tremendous pleasure, although I don't make usual films, and they're pretty crazy films, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, it, it, was, um, uh, it was reached to a large audience. And, but I still feel like I strongly believe, to the, I belong to the art world, uh, but yet I'm very, very interested in exploring other platforms. But it also felt like your photographs almost felt like they were calling out to be films. You know, they, they, you know, I've often felt, looking at your work, that there's, they're, they're still, but they hint at motion. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me that you did an opera, because mm -hmm. they're also so operatic in their quietness. And you know, Nato, that's exactly what I felt, too, because the minute that I saw the writing on the photograph, mm -hmm. I, I anticipate that Serena is going to do something else. I don't think she should be content just making technical images. So the writing, okay, Serene, the writing, particularly in the MFT, yeah. it's sort of falling off from the hand. Right, and it's a simple gesture. Maybe, Shereen, too, you could talk about yes. how that came yeah. to be, because that actually is something you'd wanted to do. I mean, I have to explain to some friends who may not be so familiar. Uh, my relationship to photography has been human portraiture and human body, and the films have been about storytelling, basically. Um, the NFT was the first time I've ever experimented with animation, literally taking a photograph and having it move. Um, and that was very fascinating because I always defined um, photography in a way that a single image tells the entire story. Mm. And it's very powerful when you have a photograph that it just, it does the whole thing, where you have to make a two-hour movie, do production design, <laughs> music, yeah. you know, dialogue and everything, and finally, hopefully, people get it. But um, what happened with this challenge that I was given, I, and at first, I really resisted it, um, but I, I liked it because I, I, I liked the progression of a hand that was concealing a message, a poem, um, for whatever reason, could it be censorship or could it be just not wanting to let go? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of poets feel that way, especially where we come from. And, and slowly it, it opens and, and it reveals the words, the poetry, and then it lets go and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it closes again. Um, for me, it's about falling in love. Mm -hmm. For me, it's about a protest. For me, it's um, um, unveiling. For me, it, it's a way of um, trying to speak out when you're not, uh, mm. you know. And, and it, it felt right because conceptually, it really was very meaningful about us as Iranians who have been dealing with censorship years mm -hmm. after years mm -hmm. after years. And yet, mm -hmm. we make the most subversive poetry. And the poetry we use were by Iranian poets who have been monumental in breaking all kinds of ground. So I, I, so I wanted to say that for a lot of people, NFT seems some kind of a gimmick. For me, it ended up after talking to Walid Rod and some yeah. of the great artists mm -hmm. he had gathered, it became a way of redefining um, you know, what an artist 
can do and what is NFT's potentials and creating something that was so meaningful yeah. and yet accessible to people who were the younger generation, people who were the younger collectors. Or it, it's, for me, it's not so different than the social media. It's like how can mm -hmm. an image grab you so instantly mm -hmm. and yet be punchy and guttural. Yeah, because it's also so, it's like slow. It also reminds me of like painting that quietly moves. That it almost feels still, but it's moving. Mm -hmm. Like the pace. And, and also you mentioned too, the gesture. It's both like a offering and a prayer. Like there's a lot communicated. Yeah. In re and because the pace is so slow, a lot of that evokes. You, you actually have to think through it as it unfolds in front of you, literally. It's really mm -hmm. beautiful that way. And, and I've always thought that about the video image is that, I mean, with this work, you need to mention, just like you said about the Zooms, like if the internet's gonna go fast, we'll do things that are slow. Yeah. But I think people think digital culture and they think quick, fast. But it's very striking when they move quietly, like haiku-like. Yes, it's uh, one of the beautiful haiku equivalent, really, is a cher cherry blossom needs not to be jealous of an oak tree. You know, uh, it's like that. In wait, come on, do another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the point is that I think there's the two things happening in serene gesture. You know, it's you say offering, yeah. and the other is prayer. Yeah. It's both. I mean, these gestures is, uh, uh, are universal. It have roots, Serene. It have roots, just like the way that, let's say, the June 8, 1989, Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. why we were so haunted by this young college student with his two bags, both hands, and trying to stop the advancing tanks of the People Liberation Army yeah. in the most important day in China. When the reason why we were so compelled, because we never seen anything like that in Asia. Am I right? I mean, for all Asian philosophy or religion, be it Taoist, Taoism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, you name it. They all share one thing in common, which is get rid of the individuality, which is the opposite of the West. The West is all the individual emphasis. It's like Christ on the cross, hanging from the cross. He's so sexy. <laughs> Very handsome, but he's also suffering. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at Buddha under the Bodhi tree, it's nothing. He's trying to reach Nirvana. Nirvana means not being there. So it was shocking that it's happening in the East. Yeah. So we saw that image recall. It reminds us of David and Goliath. It really is that, you know? So images have meaning. I mean, the gesture have significant meaning. You know, so just no more, no less than the way that we remember the little girl running from Na Naipom Bomb in 1973 in Vietnam. Sure. Her gesture is like this halfway through. It's no more, no less than the images of, um, you know, I think right after New Yorker published those horrible, horrified images, photograph of the hooded man Remember standing with all the wire coming out? Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib picture, similar gesture. Mm -hmm. It's a gesture of mercy. It's, that's what the gesture means, you know? So that, going back again, Serene. Mm -hmm. But my last question, because we wanna, want your question, is that the implicit, careful, thought out selection of poems that you would Paint it with facies, you know, facie calligraphy. To me, that is so ingenious because it 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 
it has different configurations that fit into the imagery. It's not a formula. You know, so poetry is the most subversive form. Again, I don't know you guys read poem, poetry like the way some of people in the old country, like Vietnam. Poetry is what you have. Mm. You have to memorize a poem before they burn your books and kill the intellectuals. Mm. And many of my family were killed. Mm. So you have to carry that with you through the oral for tradition. In fact, how I met Serene Soja uh, was at the wedding of Paolo Cavarani and um, Marina Ranovich. And we, we bonded through Rumi. But okay, so can you <laughs> explain yeah. a little bit? I just want to say, um, I think it's always a challenge um, to make a work that is very technical in one hand, because for me, this piece was um, how to um, maneuver the hands. Uh, it's like a movie, the, the technical part, the cinematography, the production design, all the details, yet maintain the magic or the emotion. If that makes any sense, oh because God, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's always this for an artist um, is um, that you have to face the reality. If it's a photograph, the lighting has to be good, the composition has to be good, the contrast has to be good, the handwork has to work. So there's all this um, not just technical but aesthetic decisions, mm -hmm. but yet um, you have to guard and guide the, the emotional force behind the work. And, and that was, for me, uh, the biggest challenge because I understood the limitations that we were facing for an NFT, and I think I drove his team crazy. Um, but I, I, I really, um, the pacing of the hand opening or the way that words fell, uh, what the words, you know, even though I knew majority of people couldn't read Farsi. Um, for me, these details m meant a lot um, yeah. because to me, they carried the emotions, if I could say, uh, and um, well, and it's also Shireen, just to say something so simple, which is, it's a style of work that you are very comfortable with and you know, and to bring in digital technology on top of it, which is to take two different formats and to try to integrate them in a way that didn't look jarring, to your point, was not simple, and it took some real iterations. I mean that, and that is, you know, I think that that's also a kind of challenge and opportunity for switching mediums to some degree, you know, because you got to get comfortable in the medium. But this one was kind of like taking your photography work mm -hmm. and then adding digital elements on top without it not looking like some video game. Yeah. And, and the last thing I want to yeah. say, I'm always, um, I, I go to social media like Instagram, I'm always very struck by how when we switch through images and images and yeah, we're yeah. inundated, but occasionally something just stops you. Or when you're driving and you see all these images, the banners, the posters, then there's something that stops you. And I think you, as the artist, always want to be the one that gives birth to that thing, that image that stops people <laughs> and with some intentions and meanings. And, and uh, particularly with the young people who are like very used to being you know, yeah. surrounded with digital, um, that they would actually pay attention to something that is also, you know, there's like meanings in, so anyway, for me, this was, uh, this is part of it, why I do photography and the film, because I think images can be really powerful. Anyway, that's it. And, and I want, want to ask for, add one more last thing, which is the notion of warmth as opposed to coldness, mm. which is what technology do. I think you haven't watched the uh, Mark Zuckerberg testimony you before Congress. It? Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's awesome. I had to. Okay. Um, what ultimately, he's not Martin Luther. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 So I think in a way, <laughs> I, you know, I have been awakened to the fact that technology have the brilliant magical ability to mobilize uh, knowledge-based economy and everything else in between. This is what happened um, to the printing press, 
the Gutenberg, which is what you know prompted Martin Luther did what he did yeah. to challenge the one or two, three singular of, of interpretation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, Zuckerberg and the Silicon Valley are those people who, in some way, without knowing or not, they are similar to a kind of a entrepreneur opportunist, and we should be grateful that former President Trump is not a visionary. He's also joined them in the similar uh, entrepreneur opportunist. Um, so, but still, what I want to add in the end, Serene, um, is the subversion, is the, the ability to subvert. And that's what, what we do. Um, we admire art, the work of art, music, poetry, and whatnot, uh, because it has that inherent ability to subvert. And I think that's where technology should be uh, a tools, no more than a tools. I'm, I'm learning it. We're doing it at the rail. Our new social environment is now booked till the next several years. Um, so it's always a way to bring warmth against coldness. Coldness is manipulation, reduction of language, reduction of any possible way to destroy culture, content. But if we know how to bring greater warmth into that platform, we have a new beginning. We have hope. What the great Uncle Walt Whitman called cosmic optimism. And America has always been that way. 50% belong to the tyranny of the majority, which is the mass, and the other 50% belong to the tyranny of the minority. So we just have to be mindful of the two. So slowness is our gift, Serene. Content is our equal important gift. Mm. And the other thing that we need to do, which Alexis Tocqueville talk greatly, which is the art of joining, the art of association, which is what makes America so interesting. You know, the aristocrat, wealthy, People in Europe, they do not give money away to culture. The government takes care of it. But in this country, the philanthropists, they do that. And the word philanthropy means to love people. America, in spite of its imperfection, there's a reason why people like Serena and I are here. And um, for that, I'm grateful to you for having listened to what we have discussed this evening. But I think it's time to go to you for some questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, please welcome to ask anyway, any questions. Let's give it, I have to say, Fong, Sharin, thank you, both of you. It's just a, an honor to be up here with you. So just give it up to these folks. <laughs> okay, let's take a first question. Come on. <laughs> Anybody, yes? Otherwise, we're going to walk away with the uh, dog with the uh, tail down. It's not good. Any question? About uh, anybody want to ask about Alexis de Tocqueville? Real quick, I got <laughs> <laughs> anything, you guys. About Serene's work, about America. Um, yeah, anything? Yes. Thank you for saying that, and um, I, I've been saying how um, sad I feel that the the art community hasn't been very forthcoming in showing their support um, for the uprising, um, especially for the Iranian woman, woman life freedom, those three words that are so incredibly meaningful and so universal in a way what they're asking. 
and, and that I, I'm particularly disappointed in this country hasn't shown very much support um, as opposed to Europe, for example. And, and so I always say things can happen on individual level and on the communal level. Um, the most important thing is this movement will not last unless there is this mm -hmm. momentum, unless there is this acknowledgement in the media, um, the spreading of the word, um, and, and that unfortunately we're dealing with media that is interested in selling and they, they switch news very quickly from thing to thing um, with little care for human rights issues. So um, my, my thing is that, for example, all of us as Iranians, we use our social media campaign to, to spread the word to the people who would otherwise not be aware of this. And the more this uprising, the news about it spreads, the longer it would last. So I would just say, um, yeah, just spread the word that it's a movement that is not only to profit Iranian people, but is protect human rights and freedom for all women. And if Iranian women and Iranian people lose, I think we lose as a whole in the world, fighting against power and tyranny, basically. Here, you I don't know if I was helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. She's going to come to you with a, a mic. We're never going to leave this place. Yeah. Hey, Nato. Hi, it's Barbara. I haven't even said hello yet. But hey, hi, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> Good to ask you um, a question in a Zoom-like experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in yeah. life, finally. Um, really much ties into what you were just talking about in many ways. Uh, we've talked about this NFT project last year and mm. so you always talk about the possibility of using technology not only to speed things up and make them invisible merely because we can't keep up and we're all quickly in criticizing uh, there's no substance, no substance, but actually also the ability, what you mentioned earlier, to slow things down which seems yeah. such an oxymoron. Mm. And I'm also quite adverse to this whole, uh, scared is the word maybe. But, as you told me, look deeper into it last year, there is of course all these possibilities. So tying into what you're saying, how could you imagine, um, and I guess that's part of your collaboration, but if you could elaborate on that, using the NFT project, a highly speedy situation, to slow things down and make aware, which seems interesting, if you can. Sure, I mean, I'll say something which is, here's something really dumb to say about the art world. You know, people call it capitalist, but it's, the infrastructure the art world is way more feudalist than it is capitalist. It's an old infrastructure, and it is really built on some old ideas, good and bad. But it is highly conservative in its bones. The museums, often the philanthropic model, the paternalistic model. It's, it's interested in being free, but secretly very expensive behind closed doors. Most other cultural worlds do not operate the way the arts take things for granted because it's very old. You know an addition, you know the addition, you know you gotta like, you try to make a fundraiser with an addition. I did this, you know, the NFT thing started because I got a, I was raising money for my art school and I had a Mark Dion edition. And I don't know, for anyone who's run an art space, then you go and you package it up and you mail it and you ship it out there and you think about all the time you spend. I think, I think I just made 50 bucks. <laughs> I was like, what, this isn't a fundraiser. This is like a disaster. And I was like, this is so expensive. These editions aren't helping me at all raise any money. And then the NFT thing is digital. So think of all that edition size at the click of a button. And think of the edition size as 1,000. And think of those artists, every time they're asked to give money to a fundraiser, and they know that the collector's gonna come and scoop it up for cheap, and then flip it, and the artist gets cut out, the gallery gets mad, everyone's cranky. Now the artist is cut in. Now there's royalties down the road. 
I'm trying to say to you, there's a whole other economy that's opened up with this NFT stuff. And I've been in the art world long enough, and I won't tell you this, which was like, I was at Creative Time, and I was like, why are we not charging for this? And all the millennials were like, kill him. He wants to make Creative Time for money. And I was like, no, but I just got to tell you something. It ain't all good in the nonprofit thing. Someone's getting paid somewhere. Money's being raised somewhere. People got interests. The last thing I realized after Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, I was like, yo, how are we gonna build another world without money? What, you wanna replace the Met? You think that's cheap? But we can do it. So I just wanna say this to answer your question in the most simple way. It took me a long time to take money seriously because I, you know, I'm an art person, so part of what defines me is complete stupidity when it comes to money. <laughs> and that's a lot of my friends allergic to it. But we can't build a world without taking that seriously. And that NFT stuff, that NFT stuff can build economies that give more money to artists, but also to nonprofits, to an art world we believe in. I, and that's, I'm not just shilling for it. There's a lot of crap and all that stuff. But you know, like if you look at the arts, the historic things like, remember like Gordon Maddox Clark's food or like all these cool things historically, there's all these great opportunities where people have tried to rethink the cash flow of the art world. And I think it's important that, um, that we do that, our institutions, counter institutions. So that's what I think is important. And also for artists, people say the internet's fast, but it doesn't have to be. Sharon's is slow. There's all kinds of ways to lead with what you believe in. I just think being strategic, pragmatic, and believing in great artists has always been a recipe for success. Well, um, um, I just want to mention that the idea of once I was sitting at the poetry project, it, the, right in front of me was, this must have been in 1989. I was super young. In front of me was Jonas Makers, Allen Ginsberg, and Dory Aston. So I say to all of them, one day I will recreate the counterculture that you work so hard to foster for your generation. And Jonas Makers and Allen Ginsberg look back and say to me, Fang, we're not counterculture, we are culture. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? So, it's, uh, it's, I wrote um, in my, this month editorial, quoting Kierkegaard, Southern Kierkegaard, he say, once you label me, you negate me. And I think labeling, pe giving people label and all that, pigeonhole them, is the terrible detriment to our freedom, to our creativity mm. and the community as a whole. So we have to be careful with that when we say community, what that means, you know? Mm. I think we have Charlotte Kent here who's gonna say a few things about MFT because she is our uh, editor at large extraordinaire who's an expert about this medium. Turn them off. Um, hi everyone, you're a little blurry because I don't have my glasses on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hi, I just, um, I wanted to say I just, you know, I think one of the most valuable things that NFTs have provided is this charitable giving aspect that uh, smart contracts can split in order to reward various different organizations. Um, and I guess you know, at this time, one of the things that I was just sort of wondering about is how you set it up to be able to support and whether it was in perpetuity and how you sort of manage that because that's one of the questions people often have, like, yes, I want to support this organization this year, but what happens in five years or 10, right? Because it's immutable and forever. Yeah. I mean. Well, Charlotte, you know, just to throw it back at you, and just something we should all think about is, like, we, we had a, you know, we have a, some great artists working with us, like the Albertana and Molly Drog, Sharin, 
um, Jill Maggot. But anyway, we were just having a conversation, and I was like, yo, the rules, Charlotte, you know more than anyone's, like, the rules are being written right now. And wouldn't you like to have artists helping write those rules like that understand and have a history of how these smart contracts should be worked on, what platforms we prefer, who's doing the negotiating? Because right now, you know, we're not really at the table, um, profoundly so. And there's a lot of important, the infrastructure is being built right now. And there's ways that we have power to kind of build the world we want. Um, not entirely, I'm not naive. But to that point, and I think it actually has huge implications for funding structures for nonprofits, for the ways that philanthropy is done and the ways that arts are integrated. You know, I was no offense to any of you auction houses, I'm just saying. Can you imagine if those auction houses are given 10% of their money to the arts nonprofits of the world? It's something like $78 billion, something great. I'm just saying, that's our money. How come we don't get it? So, um, you know, ever go to Art Balls in Miami? and everyone looks so rich, but all your artist friends are poor? <laughs> what is that? How long can you be a part of that world before you go like, this is just embarrassing. Like, like we just let that go on? Um, so I think there's a way to construct a different kind of way that that stuff works, simply put. Last question, maybe? No, sure. Any more questions, you guys? Yes, one more, we have one more. Hi. Um, my name is Niles Luther. I am a cellist and composer. I'm also very interested in music NFTs. Um, my question would be, it seems that in some sense, the fine art worlds and the NFT world are somewhat siloed and that they don't communicate. They're not interested in um, interoperability or collaboration between both aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, how can we create a world wherein the fine art world believes that NFTs could be a tool, um, a technology to use to um, share their art, share art with a larger world, and how can the NFT world or crypto world at large um, open, open their arms to fine art in, in a way that's not just subversively throwing out all of the tenets of the institution and classical tradition, contemporary tradition? I mean, I think that is the question. I, I will, you know, just, just to say we're in the dial-up modem era of NFTs. Yeah. Like, you can hear it when you go on, if you do it, you, you can hear basically like, Eah. that's the sound of the Web3 world. <laughs> like, it's clunky right now, but you know, people are on board. It'll, you know, it's like trying to be debate whether or not email will change the world at one point in time. You're like, at some point, you're just like, are you really debating email? It's like, we just get email. So it, I think the world, we're just in the early days of this stuff. It's here. Yeah, but it, it, uh, another question over here, and we'll take, oh. yeah, yes. We'll take two questions and then we'll we tie it up. I, I yeah. have an answer for you okay. in a minute. Hi. Hi, Shireen. It's such a pleasure to see you speak every time. Um, my question was to you um, and your work with Art World and uh, NFTs. There has been so much conversation tonight about dissemination of information, of support, of voices reaching Iran and support reaching Iran and voices from Iran being disseminated all over the world. I want to ask about specifically your collaboration with the art world. How accessible does your art become as an NFT and how do you feel about it and does dissemination matter? Dissemination matter to you when it is in the form of NFTs? Um, yeah, just wanted to understand your, um, because when this project started, I'm sure it was a completely different political scenario. I'm sure we were all thinking about it differently, but I wanted to know what you think about it now, especially when exclusivity in terms of artwork is not something, uh, and you spoke about it, that it's not something you were in the headspace of, you're thinking of. Well, I, I have to make a confession, and I'm glad it's a s small group, <laughs> that I've always felt very conflicted uh, by being this commercial artist and this uh, blue chip, whatever, and yet uh, this activist in me or the part of me that um, cares so deeply about the world. And, and, and yet, you know, um, um, Everything that I have been able to gain in the art world has enabled me to 
to make the crazy kind of films that I could never get support, um, that I spent six years not make a penny. So it's been a good exchange in terms of very honest uh, sort of dealing with, well, I have artwork that people like to, to buy and that will help me to make the work that nobody is willing to pay me or support me to make it. Um, so that's the way I look at it. Um, and so I, I think listening to NASA made a lot of sense that we as artists have never been a part of this equation. Um, we make the, the work, we come up with the concept, um, but the dealers and the museums and those people lead because our art becomes a kind of a commodity and we have very little saying in it. Uh, and they decide what is the value and then uh, they define our worth due to the value of our work, you know? Um, but to do a NFT or to do a film that will never make money, will only lose money, but will reach a huge amount of people, um, for me, it's, it, it, it somehow it's very satisfying in a way of, uh, it's like, okay, this one is not about the money. Um, and so what I'm saying to you, it's, it's, I find myself very confused very often, the decisions that I have to make, because I need the money in order to make my work, but I hate myself for needing the money, you know? And, and I hate, um, for me, I think the worst ever happened to me was I went to use the bathroom of some collector's home. I opened the door and there was a woman of Allah who was sitting in the bathroom. <laughs> and I was like, that's where you belong, you know? This is, um, and, and, and so I think at least for me, for me, I'm always um, very skeptical about artists who are becoming super rich. I think it's inherently problematic, <laughs> you know? And I, I just feel like, uh, look, I just want enough money to make my work, and, and I want my work to be seen by the right people. Uh, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but nevertheless, this is an issue for artists. Some people just want to be really, really rich, and they say, well, why should my dealer be so rich? I want to also be rich. Um, and uh, anyway, it, it, it's a big subject that we could spend a few hours on it, but uh, and, and then you have a lot of artists who make no money at all, but have really great audience. So it's complicated, I would say. I don't know if I answered the question. But. Okay, so I'm gonna answer two of your question, and that will be our last. Uh, one more? What? Okay. You have a question? Okay, please. Oh. I'm gonna answer three together, unless it's directed to Serene and and that's, yeah. I, I just wondered, uh, Shireen, if we could go back to the situation in Iran and, and your deep concern for, for, um, for artists there. And I, I'm just curious to the degree to which artists, whether they are subversively or in an underground fashion responding to the, 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 the dire situations there, or whether they're just artists pursuing really kind of just their own artistic lives, how is it leaking out? How is life for those artists? And, and, and can you just speak to, to the, the, the pressure that, that, must, that, that those artists must be under? Um, I won't take too long because I know you want to move on. Um, some of our best artists, filmmakers, are in prison right now. Uh, one of the leading filmmakers, uh, Jafar Panahi, who made some of the most important films. So, I mean, they don't kid around. They, they, they even go after the stars. Mohammad Ma Rasulov. We have um, uh, endless uh, creative and political activists that, you know, um, uh, for the voicing their opinions are in. So, um, I would say it's extremely difficult, especially now these days. There was some periods where things were opening up, but the government has gone hardliner. So extreme oppression of any type of creative imagination, writers, uh, musicians. They're arresting people who are in sports. Um, and just right and left, anyone who 
even remotely objects to anything to do against the regime is in prison uh, just to intimidate others. So I think I cannot even imagine. I heard all the galleries now are closed. The artists are just in protest. There's no activity. Everybody is on the state of like um, numbness, really. It's I mean, and just to put it, I mean, just to say it, which we all know, the reason it's hard for the United States to get their head around Iran is because it feels, like all of us, every country feels under fire from the right. And if we think, you know, it's, that's going to happen here too. Like, artists and cultural workers are, are some of the first to go. Yeah. And, and Shireen, I'm with you. Like, we got to get our act of solidarity together globally. Yes, the act of solidarity is the key, and that's also all of your questions seem to tie together. Your question about why can't musicians collaborate with visual artists and poets and whatnot, I think that that social distancing, which what Trump deployed, announced anyway, in Monday, March 16, 2020, was exactly something that has been recycled throughout as a di dictator handbook. So anybody who want to gain control over you, the first thing they do is to separate you. The very first rule, to create fear, anxiety among you, and, and I think, in a way, social intimacy is the way to go. And the other thing I would like to say is the Lawrence effects. It's very important. When I mentioned Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have a memory of history, ignorant of history, I meant it profoundly so. We have a moral obligation to read and to think, to learn everything before us, not just reading textbook text when you go to lecture. You have to live it. You have to live it. Just You have to live it. Like Charlie Parker was asked once before he died, can you describe jazz in one sentence? He says, easy, man. You don't live it, it won't come out your horn. And I think that's the condition now we must return to. Despite of the speed, technology, distraction, we have to live our life accordingly through slowness of culture, develop ourselves, to making sure that is the case, which I want to return again to Alexis de Tocqueville in the second volume, chapter 26, which is so intense, which is the 26th chapter in Machiavelli, The Prince. And what is 26? It's twice as much of 13. And what is 13? It's chance of evil. So we have to be more agile and mindful about that. So the art of solidarity, coming together, is the key. Just like what we're doing tonight is the key. We have to do it. I would love to do it every night. We do it every day at the Rail Social Environment Lunchtime Conversation. So that's so I urge you to do that, tune in, to amplify the art of joining because being alone is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. You know, it's which is different from solitude. So I think we're gonna end here because we are dying Thank you, to Paul. hear our poet musician who's gonna not serenade but But why don't we have a round of applause really quickly before we <laughs> At the rail, at the rail, we do have a tradition of ending our events with a poetry reading, and it's my pleasure to introduce Hala Liza Gafori here today. Translator, vocalist, poet, and educator Hala Liza Gafori was born in New York City of Persian descent. She grew up hearing recitations of Persian poetry and has maintained and deepened her connection through singing and translating the poetry of various Persian poets for well over a decade. Her book, Gold, features her translations of poems by Rumi, the 13th century sage and mystic, and was released in March 2022 by New York Review of Books. And with that, please give a round of applause to Hala. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shireen. It's so good to see you again after so long. And 
and Fong and everyone, NATO and all of you for being here tonight and Brooklyn Rail um, for supporting and the arts and conversation. And um, yeah, I, I, it was hard to imagine a segue when we started getting into the money aspect of things because I'm gonna be talking about a mystical poet a bit. <laughs> Um, Molana Rumi, the 13th century mystic. And it is true when Shirin talked about feeling disjointed and watching what's happening in Iran right now, uh, feeling the emotional weight, uh, the excitement and the heartbreak at the same time, it's, it's dizzying. And then to look at what you've been working on lately and see how, how does this relate, you know? And um, Molana Rumi was, you know, the shackle busting mystic. He, he was calling for liberation in all kinds of ways and all kinds of levels and he was a rebel. And you know, when music was considered among the conservatives as, uh, as best a distraction and at worst a sin, he was listening to music and he was whirling and dancing and he was finding his connection with the all and he was spouting mystical poetry. And he gave us advice, for instance, he said, if you've made a habit of drinking vinegar, don't blame the vine. Ditch the vinegar and ditch the vendor who doesn't deal in life's nectar. Pour love's wine and quit peddling misery. And that is so relevant. It goes right to the mullahs. <laughs> right to the besiji. Ditch the vendor who doesn't deal in life's nectar. Pour love's wine and quit peddling misery. Meet us in the land of insight, camped under ecstasy's flag. I like that. I'm there. I would like to be there. <laughs> you know, this uh, song that I'm going to sing now, I would like to think of it as a love letter to Persian Iranian women. Uh, it is also Molana Rumi, you'll hear in Persian. I'll sing it in Persian with a little bit of the translation, but you hear what a sensual poet he is, you know, and what an embrace, how much he embraced the sensual how much he embraced the possibility of the ecstatic, of a relaxed and compassionate existence. So, let me just tune this guitar. <laughs> Sarah made on it. 
رخش کنان کله ها هر طرفی کوره لاله شتان است از عکس تو سر میدانش رخش کنان کله ها هر طرفی کوره سال درای لند بلومز ویف تو لیبز ون یو اپیر Sour grapes sweeten Hungry for your lips When you appear Last night in my dreams I read your book of love One chapter in my soul was in ecstasy Thank you. He said, the cupbearer raises the bottle. To drink this wine is not a sin. To feel ecstasy is not a sin. Feeling guilt for feeling pleasure, that's the sin, that's the chain. Shatter it, tear it off. Then invite the Puritans over. Today is an invitation to ecstasy. Let them know. If they turn away, let them go. Let them judge. Let them talk. Let them smear your good name. You'll have less to guard. Lover, the eyes of lovers behold you. Your friend is the sea. I wish that, you know, this philosophy could saturate the minds of tyrants and of armed guards and the, the, the rings and rings of people enabling. And I know it's very naive fantasy, you know, but I still carry at least the belief that sharing the words and, and creating our own words that, that, that are creating an alternate way of seeing and being and embracing the possibility of ecstasy and, and embracing the possibility of relaxation. The woman uh, as, as this incredible source of beauty and intelligence and in some cases a portal between non-existence and existence are to be relaxed on this earth, for goodness sake. I mean, what a neurotic world comes into being when this being is not supported, is not revered. And to think that to walk through the streets and allow the wind to blow your, through your hair is, is a sin, is a crime. I mean, it does make me cry every day to look at what's happening there. And, you know, this is not just Iran. We know this. But this, there's something special. I was saying before this, this is something very special about this movement because it is a call for Aramish, for relaxation, for calm, 
for tra tranquility, for the allowance to live on this earth without stress, cortisol running through our bloodstream because some guy has a terrible lust for dominion and all the armed guards are gathering around and enabling him and his entourage. I mean, it's absurd. It's like so absurd. It's almost like we're watching this crazy movie and we're like, this is how we're choosing to be on the earth. No, no, no. To not and be able to imagine another possibility is, is the naive. I really think that's important too. You know, I'll just leave you with um, a tiny bit more of the translations. This is a gold roomy, the book that was released that of my translations that I worked on for six years, very closely with my mother. We read the poems aloud. And um, you know, my mother, uh, her, her, her father was conservative, didn't want her to be educated past sixth grade, wondered aloud if she should be educated past sixth grade. And also demanded she wear a chador at a time uh, where very few women were wearing the hijab, let alone the f uh, head to floor length chador. So my mother would leave the house, this was in the 50s, and she would, uh, when she was out of sight of the house, far enough to be out of, out of his sight, she would tear off the chador. And she graduated from Tehran Medical School in 1969 in a mini jupe and high boots so she was a rebel, really cool woman. But you know, she had to fight her whole life. And actually, it was very stressful for her. So I am victorious, but for goodness sake, you know, to imagine what we lose out on. Anyway, um, I'll just leave with, um, Let love. Abe hayate eshra dar regma ravon ne kon ravon ne kon ravon ne kon aine sabura tarjume shabon ne kon shabon ne kon. Let love the water of life flow through our veins. Let a love drunk mirror steeped in the wine of dawn translate night. You who pour the wine, put the cup of oneness in my hand and let me drink from it until I can't imagine separation. Love. You are the archer. My mind is your prey. Carry my heart and make my existence your bullseye. Eche, eyesh, cher adam shekoreto, tir zadan shoreto, shaste delam bedaskon, jon maron, neshon nekon. That's our hope. Thank you.